So uh, let me also uh, add my voice to the many that have thanked the organizers, Jan and Gerhard. Uh, I particularly want to thank them for this. So this is the only graph I will have in my presentation. Uh, this is a plot of number of downloads of a, of a paper on this subject, uh, quantum mechanics without wave functions, uh, as, as a function of time. And there's something very interesting that happens right here uh, between October and November of 2013. You can see there's this huge uptick in downloads up to over 20,000. And uh, we, of course, associate that with the EMQM 2013 meeting, which is when I first presented this work to this community. So thank you again very much for that and also to the uh, Fetzer Franklin people as well. Now, we're no longer the only people working in this area. Uh, if you were here for Howard's talk earlier today, you know that he has also a very uh, similar version of this uh, approach developed independently. Um, so he published his uh, version of this about a year ago in, in Physical Review X, and uh, I was asked to write the commentary on this. And it, it's, it's very similar to our approach. The main difference is that it's, it's a discrete version, whether it's finite worlds or countably infinite worlds, I guess that's a, a bit of a debate. But we're going to also argue that uh, in our approach, which is a continuous approach, uh, th that has certain advantages as well. But certainly infinite number of worlds. Now, the other thing that Howard did, which was very nice, is he, he came up with this phrase for the interpretational aspects of this approach. He, he calls it many interacting worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, which I think is very nice. Uh, when we um, first proposed this as an interpretation of quantum mechanics back in 2010, uh, and I think we were probably the first ones to do that, we, we didn't have this phrase. We, we sort of played around with some other phrases uh, that I wasn't very happy with, but I think many interacting worlds works very well. In any event, it's, it's kind of stuck with us. So what I will do is I will refer to his approach as discrete MIW and our continuous version as uh, continuous MIW. Now, in terms of interpretation and ontology and all of that, there's really not that much difference uh, conceptually between the two. I think th there might be some important uh, theoretical differences between the two. Uh, but in terms of ontology, basically, the, the picture that we have, uh, and this is from this, our first paper on this in 2010 in chemical physics, um, which I imagine is not on most of your re regular reading lists, so I take the liberty of putting a few uh, excerpts from that article here. Uh, but the picture we were presenting then in, in 2010 basically is, is very similar to what Howard described. In other words, you have, there is no wave function. Instead, what one has is, is an ensemble of trajectories. And uh, each trajectory is to be interpreted as, as a kind of a, a world. So this is a many worlds theory. But it's very, very different from Everett many worlds, uh, in part because we have a very sort of clear description of what the worlds are, as, as Howard uh, pointed out earlier today. Uh, but the other important reason is because the worlds actually interact with each other. They communicate. Uh, and in fact, it's that very communication that is quantum mechanics. It is both the source of and the manifestation of quantum effects in nature. Uh, so that's the kind of, those are the basic elements in, in this approach. I guess also because you have trajectories, you have uh, well-defined particle positions and momenta at every point in time uh, within a, a given world. And uh, of course, uncertainty arises from, from a lack of knowledge about which particular world uh, we happen to occupy. So, uh, so this is sort of the interpretational aspect of this that, that uh, as I said, we, we mentioned in this 2010 article. Uh, but the other thing that I actually want to stress a bit more uh, in the early part of today's talk, and, and that we also stress in this first paper, is the mathematics. Because the, the many interacting worlds, at least the way that we envision this, it, it doesn't actually come out of thin air. It, um, we, we didn't set out sort of wanting to do this. Um, we, um, we, we arrived at this through new mathematics. And the mathematics itself is not simply a rewrite of the Schrodinger equation. The mathematics uh, comes actually from, from deeper, more fundamental physical principles. Uh, so very much in line with Jan's introductory talk uh, yesterday morning about metaphysical assumptions. So we, we've made certain metaphysical assumptions and they have uh, very much constrained the, the type of dynamical laws that we can work with. And what we'll find is a trajectory-based theory pops out that is equivalent to quantum mechanics, but without assuming the Schrodinger equation or, or a wave or anything else of that kind. So uh, what I'll do in the first part of this talk is, um, uh, actually for most of the talk, I'll give a kind of a first principles derivation of a very simplified version of this theory to kind of give you a flavor of how this, uh, how this comes about. 
Uh, I'll then uh, discuss uh, briefly a comparison between continuous and discrete MIW. Uh, we'll talk about various generalizations and extensions of the theory. Basically, we could do pretty much everything now except for um, QFT, which is also on our, on our to-do list. Uh, I'll talk briefly about entanglement and measurement and then discuss prospects for experimental validation. So uh, let's start from scratch, and I mean really from scratch. Let's assume nothing, uh, no quantum mechanics, not even classical mechanics. Let's assume only that reality is somehow described by a trajectory x of t. And to make life simple, we'll assume one degree of freedom. So in fact, uh, we haven't specified yet what this trajectory is, so this is really more of a path. It's a completely unspecified curve in space-time. And uh, associated with every potential trajectory or path, we're going to posit the existence of two functional forms, one we call f and one we call g. And f is going to be a function of x itself. g is going to be a function of the time derivative of x uh, only. And uh, later on, we're going to find out that these are our potential and kinetic energies respectively, but we don't know that yet. So for now, we want these to be completely unconstrained, and just like the form of x itself is, is completely unconstrained. So this is about as general a, a starting framework for a trajectory-based theory as you could hope to come up with. And now we apply our metaphysical assumptions, okay? And we have two of them. Uh, the first one is bedrock principle of modern physics, action extremization. Whatever trajectory is followed by the system uh, from some initial to some final point in space-time, uh, that's going to be the path that extremizes the action, right? Much like in classical mechanics and, and, and various other uh, theories of modern physics. So we need an action to do this, and uh, given our anticipated uh, interpretation of G and F as, as kinetic and, and potential energy, we define a Lagrangian as G minus F, is a natural thing to do, and then of course we take the time integral of that to get our action. And then the trajectory that comes out of this is, is the one that satisfies the Euler-Lagrange equation. Okay, so this is what we get by imposing this uh, condition of action extremization. We, we get a specified trajectory. However, F and G, I want to be clear, are still completely unspecified. Okay, so if I wanted to, I could define the kinetic energy as something that's proportional to x dot to the fourth, okay, if I were so inclined. Uh, but for whatever choice I make of, of G and F, the, the trajectory is now determined, at least. Okay, so now we, we impose our second condition, which is essentially uh, a condition of energy conservation. So to be a little bit more precise, uh, because we have translation time invariance in our Lagrangian, we know there's some conserved, uh, conserved energy quantity. Notice theorem tells us that. And uh, so we're going to assume that that energy quantity is, is kinetic plus potential, right? Again, very natural kind of assumption to make. The thing is that this uh, second assumption is, um, is incompatible with the first one for a general choice of F and G. The only way to make these two assumptions, which are both very reasonable uh, from a physics point of view, the only way to make them uh, compatible and consistent is by constraining F and G as follows. So F actually turns out to be unconstrained, so we're just going to go ahead and call that the potential. Uh, G must be a quadratic form in X dot. All right, it must be proportional to X dot squared. And of course, if we set the proportionality constant to the mass over two, we get classical mechanics. So uh, you might think, this sounds familiar. We all know, of course, that classical mechanics uh, extremizes the action and uh, conserves the energy, but what I've done here is the converse of that. Okay? I started with those conditions and showed that they essentially lead to, to classical mechanics. Okay, so that's kind of interesting, uh, but you know, we want to do quantum mechanics here, so how do we get quantum mechanics out of this? Well, the only way to uh, get quantum mechanics out of this is to go to higher uh, order time derivatives, all right? So we have to consider at least second order time derivatives or higher. So uh, what we're gonna basically do is, is assume a Lagrangian that has some kind of quantum correction added to it. We call it Q. Uh, we go ahead and call the other two T and V since we now know what they are. And uh, this quantum correction that subtracts from the Lagrangian, we're gonna add to the Hamiltonian. So this uh, behaves like a potential. In fact, later on, we're gonna find out that it's equivalent to the quantum potential in Bohm Bohmian mechanics. But again, it comes from a completely different place. It comes from, from derivatives of the trajectories rather than from some kind of external uh, field, uh, let alone external wave function. So but anyhow, we're going to posit uh, uh, functionals of this form. And then we're going to go through and do the same procedure. We're going to apply our two metaphysical assumptions. 
and, and see what comes out. And what we find actually is that the form of Q is extremely constrained as a result of these two uh, conditions. And uh, we, we've actually sorted out what all of the possible allowable Q forms are. Uh, my collaborator, Jeremy Schiff, and I worked this out together. And uh, so we did basically a systematic order by order analysis. And what we find is that there are no solutions at, at second order. So you have to go to third order to find the first and simplest solution. And this is it here. And it may look a little bit strange, right? It's this weird combination of, uh, of, of derivatives up to third order of the trajectory. But there, and, and it's proportional to some arbitrary constant. You can choose the constant to be anything you like. But the really interesting thing is that if we choose the constant to be h bar squared, then the trajectories that you get out of this approach when you then apply Euler-Lagrange are exactly Bohmian quantum trajectories uh, for one-dimensional systems uh, with, uh, for the time-independent uh, Schrodinger equation, in other words, for stationary scattering states. So, and you can uh, directly go back and forth between the trajectory picture and the wave function picture if you like, but there's really no need. You can just work directly with the trajectory if you want. And by the way, at this point, we're only working with a single trajectory. So this, this is not path integral. We're not summing over a bunch of trajectories. We're, we're extremizing the action to get a single trajectory, just like you do in, in classical mechanics. Uh, the, the, oh, so this basically satisfies an ODE that turns out to be fourth order. It also has a symplectic structure. So I'm thinking there might be some connection here with some of the talks we saw last night that had third order time derivatives in X and, and also uh, in, in Ariel's talk in particular, he discussed a, a symplectic structure. Uh, another thing to come out of this incidentally, uh, although the trajectory is the same as in Bohmian mechanics, uh, what we get because we have a self-consistent formulation without an external field, uh, is we can apply Noether's theorem to come up with a momentum, a Noether momentum quantity. Wow, okay. Um, okay. Um, which is not m times x dot, it's something else. And uh, so this is something that you can't do, for example, in, in Bohmian mechanics. Okay, well, I'm told I only have five minutes left. I'm not quite sure how that happened, but um, I will have to uh, move very quickly through the rest of this talk. So. So time-independent case in 1D is not so interesting. We have to generalize this. Uh, interestingly enough, if you try to generalize this for uh, the, the one-dimensional time-dependent case, uh, so the first thing is that uh, now we're solving a PDE, so you can't get away with a single trajectory. You need an ensemble of trajectories, okay? So we have this trajectory labeling coordinate we call C, which labels our individual trajectories. And this is the object we're, we're solving for. It's our trajectory ensemble, and it should satisfy some PDE that we try to solve for. If you go through the same analysis, you would think that you would have many more choices for Q because it's a more complicated problem and, and so forth. But in fact, you don't. You have still the same limited set of, of, uh, of choices for, for TV and Q as you did before, with one difference. Q is now defined in terms of the C derivatives rather than the T derivatives, the partial derivatives. And uh, so this is where the many interacting worlds comes from, because the C derivative, after all, is, is, a, is a derivative across the different trajectories. So in fact, if you're curious about what the PDE looks like, here it is. It's a little bit messy. It's fourth order in C, and it's second order in time. But these two pieces, of course, look, look very familiar. And then this here is the quantum uh, correction. And again, it turns out to be identical to the quantum force in Bohmian mechanics, but obtained from a completely different place, completely internally uh, from the trajectories themselves and not from any external field. Okay, so we've done a lot of generalizations of this so far um, for many dimensions, uh, for relativity. Uh, we've worked out invariance and symmetry principles. Uh, we've worked out what the Heisenberg uncertainty principle looks like and, and many dimensional cases I mentioned in spin. Uh, in, in some of these cases, we can directly compare with what people have done in the Bohmian mechanics world because the trajectories are the same. And very often, although again, we always get the same trajectories, uh, we can do more than what, can, what they can do sometimes. So, so for example, one of the things we can do is a relativistic generalization, which you can't really do with Bohmian mechanics very well. And if you're interested in that, you can see my talk from, from two years ago. Uh, but in whatever minuscule time I have left, what I'm gonna do is uh, jump ahead to a quick sort of cartoon uh, description of what this approach says about measurement. So here's a very um, simple uh, description of measurement. L let me backtrack, actually. Uh, we have quantum mechanics manifesting as communication across trajectories, but the trajectories have to be nearby in configuration space, okay, in order to communicate quantum mechanically. 
So imagine that we have a very simple system. We have a uh, quantum object with a position coordinate x a that we want to measure. And then we have a classical object, uh, a needle on a, on a dial, uh, that we're going to use to measure that position in the vertical direction. And so th this is a very small scale distance. This, the vertical direction is a very large scale distance. And initially, we've not yet done the measurement. And so uh, in every world, the needle is in its neutral position. And the positions of the quantum particle are, are spread out uh, across uh, XA space. Uh, we now do the measurement. And, and, and so they're very close together because there's zero distance in this direction. And, and this, is a, this is a short distance here. So they can communicate with each other quantum mechanically. OK. So now we do the measurement. And we correlate the position of the needle with the position. And we do this perfectly. Uh, notice that all of the worlds now move in the vertical direction. So that means, first of all, that in no world is the particle at all disturbed by the measurement. Right? The particle is in exactly the same state in every world as it was before measurement. Uh, but of course, the world itself has moved uh, very much because of the fact that the, uh, the needle in any given world has moved substantially from its starting point. And as a result, all of these worlds are now uh, out of range of each other and they can no longer communicate and they no longer interact quantum mechanically. So when you lose the interference fringe in a double slit experiment, for example, it's not the, the, a change in the, in the particle that's caused that, it's actually the change in the, the measurement device that's, that's responsible for that. Okay, how much time do I have? One minute, okay. All right, so uh, is there any possibility of, um, of maybe actually validating these ideas uh, through experiment. And when, when I say validated, I don't mean uh, sort of uh, these wonderful uh, weak measurement experiments that we've uh, heard a lot about that, that sort of suggest uh, the Bohmian trajectories are real but don't necessarily prove it. Uh, I'm talking about basically predictions uh, that differ from the standard quantum theory that might come out of this approach uh, that we could therefore uh, measure in the lab. So there, I see sort of three areas where this might conceivably happen. Uh, the first is, is that it turns out that there's a whole series of these uh, quantum potentials that, that adhere to our metaphysical assumptions with terms beyond the fourth order term, right? That was the simplest, but you can go beyond fourth order and add extra terms. And so, you know, in principle, one might, one might see this in an experiment. So that's what comes out of the continuous MIW. Um, we also have in, in continuous MIW a, a single particle relativistic quantum theory, which again, you don't really get from, say, Klein-Gordon or... Uh, uh, nor from Bohmian mechanics. So that might also, in principle, lead to, to something different. And then finally, uh, in Howard's approach, this discrete MIW approach, there might well be aliasing effects due to the fact that the, the world is, is discrete rather than, than uh, continuous. And uh, our approach is consistent with the Schrodinger equation. His uh, is only in the limit of uh, small uh, discretization. So in principle, there could be some experiments there that would see this uh, discretization explicitly and, and show that his uh, uh, discrete ideas are, in fact, correct. Thank you very much. Let me just uh, acknowledge the relevant entities.